Most wrestlers get hired by WWE because they've been scouted for a certain reason. Maybe their ability on the mic grabbed attention during tryouts, or their in-ring skills marry with other assets to make them undeniable. Then there are these people. So I am Gareth here from What Culture Wrestling, and here are the 10 weirdest ways wrestlers got hired by WWE. Number 10, he could puke on command. Darren Drozdov sadly passed away recently, but he's remembered for his stint in the then WWF as Droz in the late 1990s. The dude earned some fame for spewing on the ball during an NFL game a few years before entering the wacky world of pro wrestling, and Vince McMahon was intrigued. In short, he loved the idea that Droz could vomit whenever he damn well pleased, because of course he did. The Fed boss was tickled by this and smelled money, or more accurately, he probably just smelled puke. A memorable scene from Beyond the Match showed Drozdov attempting to vom on command during an early meeting at WWF HQ. And that's really the full story. Yes, yes, that is so Attitude Era it almost hurts. Probably not as badly as Droz's stomach did after all that forced puking though. Number 9. By Totally Outshining Your Husband You've got a feel for Mark Mero. Some will hear that and yell why he was married to Sable for crying out loud. Valid, but that was part of his problem when he landed in town for a WWF meeting in 1996. Mark brought his wife along with him and everyone was smitten immediately. Vince McMahon, Vince Russo and Jim Ross saw Sable as the real star of the package. It didn't take long before Sable was offered a contract herself. Looking to keep the couple happy, the promotion put them together on programming, and even tried to present the pair as a modern day retelling of Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth for a spell. Truthfully, Sable grabbed more eyeballs than Mero as soon as she strolled through the doors at Titan Towers. Her stunning good looks paved the way to standalone fame that actually eclipsed her hubby. No one could have predicted that when Mark was headhunted from WCW. Number 8 is a favor to Stu Hart. Hey Vince, how about throwing something over to that big rhino? Apparently, this is something one Stu Hart said to Vince McMahon over the phone on more than one occasion. The rhino in question was Jim Neidhart. And Stu was only trying to look out for his son in law by ensuring he had work during some trying times in his life. That's obviously a really nice thing, and Vince rarely said no. This is why Neidhart repeatedly showed up time and time again, despite personal problems wrecking the WWF's confidence in him. Bruce Pritchard has spoken at length via his podcast about all the times Stu would phone up McMahon and ask for a little favor here or there. Pretty much every single time Jim showed up on TV following his initial 1992 release was due to one of these Stu-led phone calls. Number 7. They literally live the gimmick the WWF couldn't have handpicked a better person to play the role of shrieking urn carrier Paul Bearer in the early 90s. William Moody had earned a rep for himself as the charismatic Percy Pringle, but that contrasted vividly with his work as The Undertaker's ghoulish manager. In real life, Moody actually helped run a funeral home and had worked in the funeral industry for years, so he had key knowledge that would make the Bearer character more credible while still being totally over the top and cartoonish at the same time. Imagine that. It'd be like WWE headhunting someone to play a successful YouTuber on Raw, then Logan Paul just turning up at their door. Okay, seriously, it is rather spooky that a literal funeral home gaffer became Taker's second on TV. That must have been an interesting moment in the interview when Moody just turned around and said, I actually work in a funeral home, you know? Oh, yeah! Number 6. Wrapped Inside an Elevator You've probably forgotten all about the rapping Men on a Mission manager, and are probably rolling your eyes that he's included here. It is happening though, mainly because the story of how he got a job is just far too good. Oscar was a big wrestling fan who happened to be in Las Vegas for WrestleMania 9. The WWF's crew was staying in a hotel adjacent to the outdoor arena, and this rapping fool seized the chance to punch his tickets when he saw Vince McMahon and Bruce Prichard entering a nearby elevator in the lobby. Sprinting in, Oscar rapped some lines for both WWF officials, and it must have been the most awkward thing ever. Amazingly, Vince got a kick out of it, and later he also told Bruce to give Oscar a gig on television. Men on a mission's rap-based entrance routine was born. Number 5. Caught attention as a loudmouth Let's be honest, the WWF hired Brian Pillman in 1996 chiefly because they believed they'd be sticking it to WCW. 
Bry was playing both parties too, and even involved ECW to both sell his loose cannon character and maximize his value. He was smart, but Jim Ross claims there's more to the story than that. On his podcast, JR recalled he and Vince McMahon attending a random wrestling convention shortly before Pillman was hired by the company. Brian was working his off-the-wall, unpredictable gimmick for everyone to see, and he ranted and raved like a madman in front of McMahon. The WWF main man loved it, of course. According to Ross, Vince saw Pillman mouthing off and enjoyed how ballsy and brash he was. It's pretty out there that Brian effectively worked everybody in the business by pretending he'd absolutely lost his bloody mind. He outworked the workers and earned himself a tidy sum when putting pen to paper on a WWF contract. Number 4 as Cosplay Knockoffs Picture the scene. You're a pro wrestling hopeful who's begging for a big break. Suddenly the phone rings and it's the World Wrestling Federation. They want to offer you a job but on one condition. You'll be given a potential death spot by pretending to be someone who only left the company months before. That happened to both Rick Bogner and Glenn Jacobs. Yep, the eventual Big Red A-hole. They were tasked with mimicking Scott Hall and Kevin Nash as Razor Ramon and Diesel respectively. And even they had to know it'd suck. Still, what was the alternative? Say no to the biggest company in the land? Don't forget, WCW hadn't quite rocketed to the top quite yet, and potentially miss out on more work down the road? Who would honestly do that, eh? Bogner and Jacobs did their best to become Razor and Diesel, but they were exclusively hired so the WWF could try to win a court case, arguing that Hall and Nash were playing Federation characters on Nitro. The whole thing was as lame as it sounds. Number 3. Being the Wrong One-Legged Wrestler WWE had asked John Laurinaitis to hire a one-legged wrestler who'd been spotted on the independent circuit and in NWA slash TNA. He'd then be written into a 2003 storyline with major players like Vince McMahon and Hulk Hogan. Unfortunately, Johnny Not So Ace failed to do his homework and hired the wrong one-legged wrestler. Despite being pictured right here, as you can see, Gowan isn't the wrestler who should be focused on here. No, it should be the poor sod who was offered a deal, turned up to WWE HQ, found out what had happened and then had to leave without inking a contract with the company. How bloody cruel. WWE got their man in the end, but Laurinaitis must have felt like a prize idiot for months after this ordeal. Oops. Number 2. Being friends with the boss's son Anybody who has ever attended even one pro wrestling training session could tell you that this stuff is pretty hard. Learning to bump sucks at first, and it hurts. Of course, unless you're prepared to put the work in, then you'll never make it to the bright lights of Raw and WrestleMania, right? Enter the Mean Street Posse, or two of them at least. Neither Pete Gass nor Rodney were trained workers when they turned up on WWF telly in 1999 as part of Shane McMahon's entourage. In fact, their only exposure to wrestling at all was through Shane. Fellow posse member Joey Abs was trained though, so they had that going for them at least. Yes, Gas and Rodney were signed during the heady heights of the Attitude Era because they were pals with the boss's son away from the ring. That is absolutely insane to think about now. Though to be honest, Shane getting on TV at all at this point is about as rare as a well-worked punch from the son of the boss. Number 1. To prove Vince McMahon's point Alongside fake Diesel Glenn Jacobs, who'd again go on to slightly better things as Kane, Mick Foley is the biggest star on this list. However, even he had an odd experience when signing up for the mighty WWF back in 1996. You see, Vince McMahon didn't think Foley would be a big success in the company. Jim Ross conversely certainly did. McMahon gave JR permission to sign Mick, but warned him that he'd soon find out what it was like to have a wrestler you covet break your damn heart. How poetic. Fortunately for, well, everybody, Vince's attempted teachable moment turned out to be total BS. Foley's work as Mankind was absolute gold, and that was just scratching the surface of his contributions. It's so strange to think that one of the biggest success stories in WWF slash WWE history was given the green light because Vince planned to show someone what it was like to have their hopes dashed. JR signed Mick, he made the most of Mankind, and Foley turned into one of the best babyfaces ever. Things worked out pretty well in the end, didn't they? And that's our list. No many other weird ways wrestlers got hired by WWE. Let us know all about them in the comments section right down below. And don't forget to like, share, and click on that subscribe button while you're down there. Also, if you like this sort of stuff, then please head on over to whatculture.com and find some more fantastic articles just like the one this video you're watching right now is based on. I've been Gareth from What Culture Wrestling. Cheers for watching this video today, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.